Well, hey, I want to welcome everybody, no matter where you are joining us from. If uh, we've never met, my name is Mark, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And uh, if, if you're new, if this is your first time here, you picked a great day to be here, as we're going to teach you how to do that. No, actually, we're not going to do that. Uh, but we, you picked a great day to, to be with us, as uh, what we talk about today, I hope, both inspires and challenges you uh, to lean in a little bit more into your faith journey, no matter where you are uh, on your faith journey. I think we could all agree that uh, 2020 has been a crazy year so far. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I was talking to a friend of mine, and uh, he said he already has a countdown going, and not to Halloween or Thanksgiving or Christmas, he has a countdown going to January 1st, 2021, which got me thinking, you imagine what the New Year's Eve parties are going to look like this year? You know what I'm saying? They are going to be crazy. But before we can get to a new year, the reality is we have to finish up this year, and I think we all know it's going to get crazy, possibly even crazier, especially over with the next few weeks coming up. Now, how many of you have, have heard someone say this uh, over the last few months? We live in unprecedented times. And heard anyone say that? We live in unprecedented times? Yeah, I don't know about you. I want to vomit, you know, because I want, to, I want precedented back again, you know? I'm sick of living in unprecedented times. Because more people today, they're anxious. More people today, they're, they're afraid. They're more agitated than ever before. Uh, today, people are really just wrestling with the uncertainty of their future. Uh, more people today, they, they wonder who to believe and what to believe. Uh, more people today are falling back into destructive habits or falling into destructive habits. They're falling away from God. I mean, life isn't working the way I want it to work. So today what I want to do, I thought it'd just be a good idea to just take a week and for me to just share a couple things that, that are on my heart as I've taken some time to just step back and try to discern uh, these unprecedented times that we are now living in. And the reason why this is important, because I, like many of you, would love 2020 to be passed as well. But I also know that God is not surprised that, of anything that has happened over the last six or seven months. It's not like we have to go, hey, God, did you know that there is a pandemic going on right now and then we're in the middle of a contentious election and God's just going, what? Oh man, thanks for letting me out. I had no idea. The reality is, is that God knows. And because of that, I just think it's really important to take time and to ask some bigger questions that might, that might need to be asked. Questions like this. Uh, why is God allowing some of this to happen? And what might he be up to? And what might he want to say uh, to us? Because, and if you've been here over the last couple months during this time, I, I've said this, I believe that God doesn't just want us to get through this time. I think God wants to do something significant in you and in me and in us during this time. But to get there, we have to be willing to do something that for most of us, we've not even considered. Now, before I begin, I feel like I need to say this up front. I am fully aware that mostly everything is received through a political filter nowadays. And so please do me a favor. I want you to take your political filter, and I want you to take it off, and I want you to set it aside for the next few minutes. Because what, I talking about, what I'm talking about, uh, I am not pushing a party or a platform. Never have, never will. This is what you would call a non-political conversation we are about to have. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at a passage where Jesus introduces us to something that has created a lot of confusion uh, over the years. And what Jesus introduces us to is this idea of the local church. And not only does he introduce us to the idea of the local church, he helps us see it in a context that for most of us, we do not see it in. Either because we were never taught about this context or for many of us, you know, this is going to sound a little bit weird. And so you're going to hear it, and you're going to go, what do I do with that, you know? And so if you feel a little weird in hearing about that, listen, it's very, very normal. So here's a little background. Jesus, one day, is having a conversation with his disciples when he decides to give them a pop quiz. And he says to them, hey, I just want to let you know, guys, who do people say that I am? And they give a slew of answers, which would have been very common answers for young Jewish boys to give back then. And then Jesus, he turns the pop quiz to Peter. And he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And so here's Peter's response. He says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, this word Messiah means chosen one. 
You see, the Jews believed that God would someday send a chosen one, and this chosen one would set them free from oppression from other nations, much like God sent Moses to the Israelites to set them free from the oppression of the Israelites. And so for Peter to answer this was a very significant answer. And then here's how Jesus responds to him. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was, and then listen to what he says, was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And so Jesus introduces both them and us to a huge idea. He says, Peter, you didn't come up with that on your own. Something outside of you helped you come up with that. And in this context, God helped him. God revealed that to him. And so Jesus introduces both him and us to this idea that there is something more at work in our world than what we can see. And then Jesus continues on his answer. And he says, and I tell you that you are, and this is where he changes Simon Peter's name to just Peter, and he does a little play on words, that you are Peter. Name means rock. And he says, and on this rock, I will build my church. In other words, if I'm going to build something, I want to build it on something solid, so I'm going to build it on rock. So on this rock, I will build my church. And this is the very first time the word church is used in the entire Bible. Let me ask you, what do you think of when you think of church? Now, I would bet there's, there's all different answers to this, some good, some not so good. But for most of us, I think we, we think church is a place I go to and attend a church service where it hopefully doesn't last more than an hour because I've got a busy life to go get going right now. And uh, it's this place that we go to and we sing a couple songs. I may flip a couple bucks here or there. And then I listen to or or watch a, a message. And most of it is done by the professional Christians, whatever that means. And then when the service is done, and then I just, I leave the service and I go on with my life until the next week. And then I decide, am I going to go to church again? But the word church that Jesus uses is actually this Greek word, ekklesia. And ekklesia means this. It means to assemble, gather, called out ones. And so here's the definition of church as Jesus defined church. He defined church this way. It's just a community of people who gather together for a clear cause. Now, community of people, it's a group of people of all ages, all socioeconomic and ethnic backgrounds who are committed to following Jesus as their leader and savior. And this community of people, they get together not to just attend a church service. If you notice, they gather together for a clear cause, to be a part of something bigger. And that bigger is to partner with God as he reaches into our very broken, hurting world, and then he calls that world back to himself. And this cause, because of the impact it can have, is the most significant cause in the entire world. As you think about church, I want to suggest to you a real shift in mindset. And it's going to seem small, but it actually is huge when it comes to understanding the church that Jesus died for and the church he is now building. Here's the mindset shift. We don't go to church. If Jesus was standing here and we said, hey, Jesus, I'm going to church, he would go, what are you talking about? How do you do that? He he would look at us like we were crazy. See, we don't go to church. The church is not a destination. The church is an identity. The church is not a building. The church is people. You are the church. I am the church. We together are the church. All of people say to me, Mark, I go to your church, which is actually impossible because it's not my church. It is Jesus' church. I'm a part of it. You are a part of it. We are a part of it together. You see, the church is not me. It's us and we. And then what's great is right after Jesus introduces this idea of the church, he then gives us a new filter for how we can both see some of our circumstances and some of the circumstances we are seeing in Our world. And he says this. He says, I'll build my church. And then he says, and the gates of Hades, which Hades can be translated death, evil. It's synonymous with evil powers or forces that set itself up against the purposes of God. And in other words, once again, Jesus is referring to this reality 
that there is more at work in our world than what we can see, that there is an unseen world that is a part of our world. And he says, hey, this gates of Hades, it will not overcome it. In other words, it's not going to overpower it. It's not going to take over. It's not going to take it down. And so the first time Jesus talks about the local church, he talks about the reality of this collision of kingdoms. And the collision is his church, his people, you and me, colliding with forces that set itself up against God's purposes in the world. In other words, Jesus used war language when he talked about the local church, which I don't know about you, that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I wish Jesus would say, you know, hey, I just want you to get together and sing a couple peaceful songs, you know, and uh, I want you to hear a very positive, uplifting message, and then you can just kind of go on your way and feel good about yourself. Now, what's interesting is, is that all of the New Testament writers, they saw the world in this way. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, he wrote this passage to a, a, a church that he started, and this group of people that he wrote to, they were going through just some horrible, horrible things. And I'm going to read to you this passage, and as I read to you, I just want you to notice the language that Paul uses. He says this. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full, and this is the language, armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And it's like, oh, no. Mark, you don't believe in the devil, do you? Actually, I do. And you know why I do? Because Jesus did. And Peter and John, who walked with Jesus, did. And the apostle Paul did. And all the New Testament writers did. And he uses this phrase, devil schemes. In other words, strategies that he uses to set himself up against the purposes of God in the world. In other words, purposes of God in your life, in your family's life, in your community's life. And then he continues, and he says, and this is such great language, for, for our struggle. Now, this word struggle, most of us have never thought of our faith journey with, through this lens. But let me ask you this. Have you ever noticed how much of a struggle it is to follow Jesus? You know what a struggle it is to just take steps, even baby steps, to follow Jesus? It's kind of like, hey, let's go to service today. Eh, I don't know. I've got a lot of things to do and all that stuff. Maybe not. Hey, you, we should get into a group. It could really help us. And I think having some, some connections, having, having some friendships in our life to do that, I think it'd be a good idea. Yeah, I know. But you know what? I'm doing fine on my own. I don't really need anybody to do that. Hey, I... You got this thing going on. Maybe you should pray about it. I know I should, but I just don't really have the time to do so. You ever notice what's not a struggle? Not following Jesus. It is really easy to do. Most of us have never considered the idea that that struggle might be part of a larger campaign. And he says, for our struggle is not against, and listen to the language, flesh and blood, the very same words that Jesus used. And so Paul's like, hey, our struggle isn't against Rome, even though I know you all think our struggle is against Rome. It's not against people. It is way bigger than that. And he says, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I guess Paul, ooh, there's a lot there in all that. But I just want to take a look at this line right here because the powers of this dark world, I don't know about you, but as I look at our world right now, doesn't it seem to be getting darker? Now, I want to, I want to go back to what Paul said when he talked about the devil's schemes idea for a minute. Because when this becomes a part of your worldview, there'll be things in your life and things in the world that currently don't make sense that when you begin to understand this filter will make a lot more sense. I've seen that there are really three strategies or schemes that are often used in, in this area. And like I said, when you begin to see things through this filter, a lot of things will start to make sense. Three strategies. Here's the first one. Discouragement. What is discouragement? It literally means this, to lack courage. What's the opposite of discouragement? Encouragement. So here's encouragement. Encouragement is this. God loves you, he died for you, he is for you more than anybody is for you. 
He made you on purpose for a purpose. You are loved by God more than you can be loved by anybody else. Here's discouragement. God could never love you. He's against you. He is mad at you. He doesn't care. He could never use you. You could never be forgiven. You will never measure up. That's discouragement. Let me be really transparent with you for a minute. Over the last few months, I have gone through more what I call dark night of the soul moments than I would like to admit. And in those dark night of the soul moments, I have just began to wonder, is, is, is there going to be a church left when all this is done, God? And are people going to stay connected with each other? Are there going to be community with each other? Are they going to serve other people? I mean, God, are they going to give so the mission can move forward? And uh, I have to, when I'm going through that time, I have to finally realize that while there are challenges to this season that we are in, God doesn't use discouragement. I often have to remind myself, oh yeah, there's that collision again. There it is. Here's a second strategy. Division. Hopefully, I don't have to convince you that we live in a very divided country. Uh, it's why I have to start a message like this and go on, no politics here because there are no neutral topics anymore. But do you know what division does? Division limits what a person or a group of people can accomplish because it pits people against people. You know, now, when I, when I talk about division, I, I'm not saying that all of us have to agree on everything. In, in fact, I, I think as a local church, we have people across the political spectrum here. Even on our staff, we have across the, the full political spectrum here. And here's the thing. I like that. I think we're a better church because of that. And if you're, if you're thinking about going to a church where everybody looks like you and they believe like you, and that includes politically, listen, I just think you would be doing yourself a disservice, that you don't want to go to a church like that. And listen, we don't want to become a church like that. Because the church that Jesus is building, it's made up of a group of people who don't agree on all sorts of things, including politics. But the one thing they do agree on supersedes it all, the cause. And when the cause is first, people become first. And when people are first, it provides unity even in the midst of disagreement. Third strategy is death. Death. And I'm not talking about physical death here. I'm talking about the ending of something before it was meant to end. I'm talking about the death of a relationship, I'm talking about the death of a family, I'm talking about the death of a calling, a dream, a church. I'm talking about the death of things like freedom for women and children and religious groups. I'm talking about anything that ends before it was meant to end. Let me ask you a question. As you look at the world, as you look at your world, you see any of this going on right now? You see any of this? And what if there was more going on behind it than what we can see that is fueling this whole thing? And I understand that's hard, and I understand that's uncomfortable for us all. But what if... What Jesus said about the collision of kingdoms is actually happening. And the larger question, what if we could actually do something about it? Now, I believe that we can. And here's what we can do about it. Here's what we can do about it. We can fight. We can fight. In fact... This is our big idea for today, and, and I know for some of you who, who follow Jesus or been in church for a while, you, you don't even think about this whole idea, but here's our big idea. To follow Jesus is to fight. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, you know, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Well, listen, you got to be both now, all right? We got to grow up. We got to be both. I actually used to kickbox for three years. In other words, you don't mess with this that's on stage, all right, without paying the price. And I kickboxed for three years, and I tell you, I loved doing it. I, I mean, I loved hitting the bag and doing that whole thing. But you know what? My favorite part of kickboxing was, was sparring. And here's the thing about sparring. With sparring, what is the goal? The goal is to hit before you get hit. Or if you get hit, it is to hit back. To follow Jesus 
is to fight. But it's not to spar like we often think about sparring because here's what Paul said and here's what Jesus said, that our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against people who vote one way or vote another. Our fight is not against mask wearers or not mask wearers. Our fight is not against people who post one way or post another. Our fight is not for our rights or being right. Our fight is not against people. It's way bigger than that. That our fight is against anything unseen that sets itself up against the purposes of God for people. To follow Jesus is to fight. Now, you might be asking, okay, (laughs) that's great and weird and uncomfortable all at the same time. How do I do that? I mean, Mark, do you want me to go and buy some boxing gloves and then just kind of walk around and then just start swinging in the air unseen and maybe I'm hitting something, you know, as I'm kind of doing that and all that stuff? Listen, just a little side note. If you do that and someone asks you what church you go to, you don't go here, all right? I'll give you a list of names of churches that you go to, all right? No, that is not what we do. We fight, but we fight in a much different and more impactful way. We fight the way of our Savior, who would never, ever fight with these. Instead, he fought with stuff that are so much better than these. He fought with this stuff right here. And this is just a small list of the things that he fought with. But let me just go through just a few of these things that he, that he would fight with. Prayer. If you've ever prayed about anything in your life, here's what you did, and you may not even know it. You just validated what Jesus said, that there is more at work in our world than what we can see. But let me ask you this question. Have you ever, ever prayed in a way where you just cried out to God to move so powerfully in your family, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in our community before? Have you ever done that before? Love. Uh, Today, you often hear people say, love not hate, love not hate. And what's interesting about it is it's it's usually said by people who who are hating, which is kind of always interesting to me. And every time I hear someone say that, I'm like, what does that even mean? You know, it's like love, not hate. What what is that? Now, as a Christian, here's here's what's great about it. We know exactly what that means because we follow Jesus and Jesus is the very essence of love. He's it. And so this is why around here, we always ask this question, what does loving like Jesus require of me. Humility. Humility really has two main things to it. It has reality and need. Here's the reality. I don't have all the answers. And let me break reality to some of you. You do not have all the answers. In fact, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you do not have all the answers. Go for it right now. Oh yeah, for some of you, you're like, I love this church now, man. This is great. Yeah, that's right. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. And so you know what that reality means? We have a need. Because we don't have all the answers, we need God. That's reality. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Sacrifice. I lay down my agenda, my needs, my wants, my rights for something or someone bigger than those things. Generosity. We know what that is. Grace. You know what grace is? Grace is giving to people what they don't deserve. If you're a Christian, it's giving to others what God has given to us. And let me just say this. If the local church in this country just did this one right here, we would transform the environment in this country. Courage. You know why it takes courage? Because everybody's pulling these babies out and fighting back. It takes courage to do what few are willing to do, and that's take the gloves off and set them down, and then serving one another. History shows that when the church fights like this, God moves and everybody benefits from it. Uh, last year, I read this book called Jesus Skeptic. It was written, it's written by a guy named John Dickerson. I cannot recommend this book enough. Uh, if you have a skeptical friend, I can't recommend this book enough to, to your skeptical friend. Uh, John uh, has won multiple journalist, top journalist awards, and he was an agnostic. And so he set out to write this book, and here was kind of the, the premise of the book. It was this. He wanted to research uh, the influence, if any, that Christianity had after Jesus had died. 
And so he did all this research, and the stuff that's in this book is amazing. And this isn't like theoretical stuff. This is like uh, graphs and charts and numbers. I mean, some of the stuff that's in this book, it's like, holy smokes, I never knew that before. And the, 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 the finding is this, is that, that, that Christianity, there's irrefutable evidence that Christianity has helped launch the scientific revolution. Yes, the scientific revolution. Public universities, public education, hospitals, women's rights movements, and uh, racial equality movements that we are still feeling and experiencing, thankfully, to this day. And so John, as he does all this research, he becomes a follower of Jesus. Why? Because history shows that when the church fights this way, God moves, and everybody benefits from it. Uh, as a church, we have tried to do our best to organize ourselves so you can be in the fight. And so you've probably seen this picture before if you've been around here the last couple months. Uh, this is our, our cause statement, our mission statement, helping people find and follow Jesus. And then this part right here, we call this the Great Commission Engine, literally the operating system that drives our entire church. And what's interesting is not just that drives our entire church, this is the operating system that drives people that have growing faith as well. And so you have this, the weekly service part. And this is the question we always ask. Are you regularly attending a, a weekly service, whether it be in person or online? And we, we just, there's just something that happens. There's something that God does when we just come together in this way. Now, if you have kids and students, I, let me just encourage you with this. Keep them connected somehow. Because if we don't keep our kids and students connected during this season, we risk losing an entire generation because of it. Now, as we've said with the definition that we said we thought church was, we just don't want people attending a service. We want people connected with other people because we don't fight alone and we weren't created to fight alone. We were created for community. That there is people that come along, that they're supposed to be there with us that, we, that fight with and for us. And then there's this component that we call the surrendered living side of things. I call this, this is where you really start to get into the fight, so to speak. This is the action side. And the question that we ask here is, are you using your time, talents, and treasures for the building of his church? Are you using your talents that each one of you has gifts and abilities that have been given by God? Are you using those to serve other people? Treasures, are you using the financial resources that God has given you to honor him to the building of his church? And then all the stuff of these components fuel this middle part right here, which is the most important part, which is your one. And your one is one person in your life that you are investing in who doesn't follow Jesus. And let me just say this about that middle part. This is where the fight is by far the fiercest. So let me ask you a couple questions. Are you engaging in the fight? And if not, why not? And then the second question, which is for everybody, what is one step? Not 20, you know, not, well, I'm not doing enough or anything like that. No, 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 no. Just what is, what's one step that you can take to more fully engage in it? You know, maybe for some of you during the season, you've just stopped attending on a regular basis. Maybe that's, maybe that's your one step. That is a very significant step. For others of you, it is you get into a small group so you can get some people around you that will fight with and for you. And if you're not in a small group, stop by the Next Steps room and get into a small group. Maybe it's, it's, you start serving somewhere. Maybe you start giving. I mean, maybe for some of you, you're going to be more prayerful and intentional about investing in your one. Listen, God created you to be in the fight. In fact, when you're in it, you will never be more fully alive. I want to go back to the passage that we looked at earlier. Read it again. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. And then right after this, and the gates of Hades, the gates of death, the gates of hell, will not take it down. And for 2,000 years, the gates of, of hell have not prevailed and Jesus has been building his church. In fact, his enemies thought they had won when they nailed him to a cross, but three days later, he rose from the dead 
and the gates of hell didn't prevail, and ever since then, Jesus has been building his church. And then this group of 12 disciples grew to a group of 120, and then shortly after that, Pentecost hit, and it exploded to 3,000 people. And then it's experienced steady growth, but then a couple years later, one of their leaders was put to death. He was stoned to death, actually. And as a result, things looked bleak because the church got persecuted and everybody started to scatter all over the place. But when it scattered, they started to plant new churches in the most unlikely places, and the church grew to over 100,000 people. And the gates of Hades and the gates of hell did not prevail because Jesus was building his church. And from 250 to 261 AD has been known as the decade of horror, and horror it was, where people, thousands of people that followed Jesus, they were murdered, they were beheaded, they were crucified, all because they chose to follow Jesus. But the gates of hell did not prevail, and Jesus kept building his church. And then throughout the centuries, the church has experienced dark seasons, scandals, and embarrassing seasons, but the gates of hell did not prevail, and Jesus kept building his church. And to the present day, guess what country has experienced the fastest Christian growth ever? It's in communist China, where it is illegal to follow Jesus. And each day, thousands of people make decisions to follow Jesus. In fact, over 130 million people are following Jesus in communist China, where the government is trying to stop it, but they can't stop it, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Why? Because the gates of hell will not prevail. And Jesus will build his church. And I tell you this because this gives me great hope. And it should give you great hope. Because in the midst of all the craziness and chaos, we are seeing more people open to God than we were before all this. People are Google searching God, prayer, and spiritual things at a record number. Which means, today, in 2020, in our country in our state, in our city, in our neighborhoods, right in our own homes. God is at work. He is building his church, which means he wants to do something significant through you and through me and through us during this time. But listen, you can't settle for just attending church. Listen, you're the church. I'm the church. We are the church, and we are invited to be a part of the most significant cause in the entire world. But to be a part of it, we have to fight because we are in a fight. But if you do, here's what's going to happen. Jesus will build his church. And if you allow Jesus to build his church into your life, let me tell you something. You will never see anything like it, and you will never regret it because the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let me pray for us. And Father, um, for us, it's often, as we look at our world, as we look at our own world, we often don't see the big picture of of things, of how Jesus taught us to see things, how the writers of the New Testament taught us to see things, how you see things. But Father, we're in a fight. And... um, for, for some of us, that's a little uncomfortable, it's a little weird. But for others of us, that's freeing, because now we know. And uh, God, the, the calling is not to put boxing gloves on and go after people. The call is to fight the way you fought. And uh, in doing so, uh, we go after where the real root is, and that's what the things that we don't see. Father, I thank you for the calling that's on us as your followers. And uh, what that means And um, God, as we think about this, just the significant things that you want to do during this crazy, chaotic time, uh, God, but we have to be willing to lean in. And I pray we would do that as a church. And wherever we're watching, wherever we are, that God, that we would not give in to just all the stuff we see around us, but instead we would rise above and embrace the higher calling. And that is to fight against anything that sets itself up against your ultimate purposes for people. God, thank you that you've called each one of us to be a part of the most significant cause that we could ever ever be a part of. And that's because it has the most significant impact that that people could experience, that we could experience. 
Father, thank you for it. I thank you for what you're doing. And as we continue to go through 2020, may we lean in and may we fight and may we see you do a great, great work here. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.